Uh, welcome to uh, the first installment of Fall 2020's Lunch with Friends and Strangers. Uh, we are so delighted uh, to be bringing this back, a uh, wonderful joint project with the General Alumni Association. I want to thank uh, Kat Nichols and all of our friends over at the General Alumni Association for backing this wonderful program. We had a great time in the spring talking with a lot of great faculty and learning a lot about some people that we've maybe heard of and others that we uh, absolutely have not introduced today. I think many of you will have heard of today's stranger, uh, but uh, most most important uh, is, is, of course, our friend, and we'll get to that in one moment. Before I begin, I do, of course, want to reiterate my thanks to the General Alumni Association, and you saw our wonderful list of sponsors, the Cotton Murphy Group at Morgan Stanley, Carolina Meadows, uh, and, of course, uh, uh, our, our wonderful friends at Flyleaf Books who have been doing uh, all sorts of great work with us at our Flyleaf Books studio. I'm now in the, what I call the Shea Orr studio back at my house, and my daughter, who has moved out of the home, has given me uh, her office she doesn't know this give me her bedroom as her office so this is what the world of zoom is very intimate but at the same time very intellectual without further ado we got a lot to get to because this is no normal friend this is none other than lloyd kramer the director of carolina public humanities professor of history um i couldn't think of a closer friend to start with so let's turn on our camera and welcome our friend coming in here um hello lloyd Hello, Max. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I can't think of anyone I'd rather talk with or about who I'd rather talk. Yes, so indeed. What, Good. A, what a combination. Lafayette Good. and Max. There we go. The two things that go together, like I'm trying to find a rhyme scheme there, but I'm just going to leave <laughs> that aside. Uh, the uh, So great. We know who we're talking about. Why don't we pull up an image to let you know so that you have some authority on this. Uh, you've written about Lafayette a, a bit before, haven't you? Yes, I have, and I, have I want to begin by sharing an image, if that has come up on the screen. Mm -hmm, it sure has. Lafayette it's, in two worlds. It's a public cultures and personal identities in an age of revolution, which gives you a sense that uh, we can look at Lafayette uh, to get insights into more than just about a biography. And I think that's one of the beauties, of course, of this biography series is that people are embedded in context and people are embedded in much larger things than just themselves. And for all that people do all sorts, which kind of question came up the other day about great, great men of history, uh, people have incredible uh, uh, impact on those contexts and those events. Uh, but we do need to keep uh, in mind that they're part of a larger public culture and larger important things. I know there's a particular uh, word we used in describing this friend and it's one i don't think everyone always associates with lafayette and that's polarization and uh you have a picture here of lafayette uh in uh, in 1822 um this is uh this is in the u.s house of representatives yes this is a, an image of lafayette painted by the french artist ari Scheffer in 1822, and when Lafayette came to America on a return visit in 1824, this was presented by Sheffer to the House of Representatives. It was placed in the main chamber, and it remains to this day a very prominent image in the House of Representatives. And, and of course, the House of Representatives is a place uh, that has seen its share of polarization. Uh, Lafayette here looks pretty comfortable, uh, but he's been through a whole life in which he has been um, either pushed to one side or the other or has uh, bemoaned the division in his society. So why polarization with Lafayette? Why is this the theme that you wanted to focus on as we go through his life? Well, as you mentioned, when you talked about why is biography significant, this is important to me because I got interested in Lafayette not not only because he was a, a particular person, but because his life connected with all of the great conflicts of what's often called the age of the Atlantic revolutions, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, even the French Revolution of 1830. And through Lafayette's career, we can see a, an individual striving to define a middle position, a position as a mediator, a collaborator, someone who wants to listen to both sides and yet always holds very clearly to his own points of view. He's, he's not a wishy-washy, you know, person with no, no commitments. And that's what fascinated me about Lafayette. You know, it's interesting when we think about the age of democratic revolutions, and of course we all know that these are incredibly volatile ages with a lot of uh, violence associated with them. And in, in fact, 
Uh, but there is a sort of triumphant narrative, you know, that, that this is sort of an inevitable pro progress that's happening. And Lafayette seems to always be one of these people that uh, is sort of situated as a, an example of the good of, of, this, of this era, that he has sort of maintained this progress. But we, we need to understand him as being absolutely immersed in polarized politics, that uh, it's not just the simple uh, Shangri-La that we're all moving towards democratic revolution. The, the resistance is just as important as the progress, and that Lafayette absolutely saw that uh, both viscerally in violent conflict and also, of course, with the uh, struggle of ideas. Yeah, I, I think if, if you look at, at the main events of Lafayette's life, the significant aspect of each of those events was they were extremely conflicted. We think of the American Revolution as the triumph of the Patriot Party, but American society was profoundly divided between loyalists and patriots. And therefore, from his very first political and military actions, Lafayette was mediating and looking for ways to work with different people, but he was also on one side of a highly polarized conflict. And during the French Revolution, he tried to steer a middle course between constitutional monarchists and radical Republicans, and he failed. He, he was uh, basically removed from his position as a commander. He fled, he was arrested, he was put in prison in, in Austria and Prussia, five years in prison. And then later he came back to America in 1824, and America was again deeply polarized between the supporters of Andrew Jackson and uh, John Quincy Adams. So the fascinating thing to me about Lafayette is, just as we are living through incredibly polarized times right now, that was the story of Lafayette's life. And it wasn't easy. It was never easy. You know, it's, uh, it is something to be said, and it might be a little depressing, is that polarization seems to be more normal than abnormal. In, in political uh, thought, especially after the age of democratic revolutions. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's sort of a, a dream that somehow national cultures will be harmonious and coherent. But in fact, what constantly happens is they, they split into rival interpretations and often they become violent even, as we see in the American and French revolutions. Well, we're gonna take a, we're gonna go back, come back to some of these episodes in Lafayette's life, but let's get uh, to a little bit of an origin story. And I know one of the earliest images, why don't you pull up the, uh, the uh, Peel image of, uh, of Lafayette. This is one of the earlier images we see, uh, not this one, but. Let's see if I can get it to advance. There we go. Yes, yes. this is Lafayette in 1779. He had joined the Continental Army in 1777. And I should just say a word about why this young Frenchman came to America. Uh, he was uh, in the army in France, as many young noblemen were, and he was unhappy with the situation. He heard about the American Revolution and he decided he was gonna join the American Army. He went to Paris, he met the American representative, Silas Dean. Dean offered him a position, he came to America. So how There's old been a big he, debate about what, what were his motives? That's a big debate. How old was he at the, uh, at the time? Is he 20 years old at this point? Or? Well, when he came to America, he was 19 in the summer of 1777. Okay. And he bought his own ship. He had no money. I mean, he had money. He had no authority to come. He secretly went to southwest France. He bought a ship. He was from a wealthy noble family. And he paid for his own passage to come to America. Uh, nice work if you can get it, right? The, uh, so I'm curious about him, uh, this decision he made. Let's, what makes him uh, atypical for a nobleman of his time and what might be actually more typical and maybe that people don't realize about the aristocracy in France? Um, how about his youth? Was he raised in a particularly liberal family? Um, and how did he come to uh, feel like this was a calling of his? Well, his family was an older noble family. It had been around for a long time. His father had been in the army. He was also a nobleman, of course. He was killed, the father, when young Lafayette was only two years old. He never really knew his father. He was raised by his mother, his grandmother, various other family members, and his mother died when he was about 13. And so he was raised by family members educated finally in the Lycée in Paris where he read Plutarch. He was fascinated by Plutarch's story of lives of ancient people who did heroic 
and glorious things. And this was part of Lafayette's inspiration. Like many young French educated noblemen, he dreamed of glory. And so he supported the American Revolution. I think he, he understood that these were new ideas, but he also saw this as a place where something important was happening in the world. But was he, he uh, was he, you know, one of the sort of byproducts of many of these folks, of course, I just recently was talking about Napoleon read Plutarch, you know, just about everybody read Plutarch in the 18th century, educated young schoolboy. Was he um, interested in classical ideas of republicanism? Uh, even as he went over there, because of course he is a, a member of the nobility and the nobility is very much tied to the monarchy in France. So how did that fit in his political philosophy going over to... Uh, to I, I don't think it would be possible to say that Lafayette was a Republican when he came to America. He had not worked through his political ideas like that. And in some ways in France, he was never a thoroughgoing Republican. He, he was what we would call a constitutional monarchist. But in the United States, he was a staunch Republican in small r, you know, in the traditional sense of believing it should be a society that was not governed by a king. Um, I think he came to understand the concepts of human rights and human freedom much better when he was in America. And he, he was motivated to come here from idealistic goals. That is that he wanted to do something that made a difference in the world even though it didn't make him any money. But he, he came to understand republicanism and human rights through his experience in the American Revolution. Uh, this is uh, just an aside. Did he have any anti-British sentiment uh, that animated him at all in going over to the United States? Uh, well, actually, this is, this is one of the theories about his motivations. His father was killed during the Seven Years' War in a battle against uh, where British soldiers were fighting the French and his father was killed by a British artillery sh or, you know, uh, shell. So some people said he always wanted to get back at the British because, well, they killed his dad. Well, there you go. That's one way to. So uh, we we have a sort of a sense of him as a, um, a typical uh, educated noble. Not all people who read Plutarch end up going and actually, you know, doing these sorts of uh, actions. For others, it's more sort of abstract. He's an interesting person because his ideas are always sort of. Uh, uh, his ideas are mirrored by action, which I think is a, an interesting uh, concept. Here's someone who, you know, this incredible act of buying a ship and going over there gives you some insight into his personality. Uh, was he always impulsive this way, or did, did he always have a sense of being driven to act on his beliefs? Uh, you know, I think he was especially impulsive, to use that word, when he was young. Uh, this is not an unusual pattern, I suppose. He became perhaps more cautious as he grew older, but he was always someone who wanted to take decisive action. And even at the end of his life in 1830, here, here's a man who's 73 years old and he joins the revolution of 1830 and becomes the leader of the Parisian National Guard. When uh, many people in their, I guess nowadays people in their 70s run for president, mm -hmm. but in the 1830s it was not so common for people to get out there and take the lead. So he was still taking decisive action and also, I would say, impulsive, even in 1830. Yeah, it's finally in 1830, he got that constitutional monarchy he'd been hoping for his whole exactly. life. Exactly, he, he got what he wanted, which was a regime like Louis Philippe. Well, as you know, this is not a typical sort of a chronological march through Lafayette's life. What we want to do is focus on certain episodes in mm -hmm. his life that you think might um, help exemplify this, this theme of polarization, his own contention with this. So what is the first uh, element? I want to pull up a picture here, uh, Lloyd, that you have for us that would, might sort of trigger uh, one episode that kind of situates him in, uh, in a, uh, a situation in which he had to make a decision and come on one side or the other. So you want me to share? Yes, go ahead and share your next uh, your next picture there. I think we're going to move up to. Uh... Okay, so I have also here a picture of um, Lafayette with Washington, which was one of the reasons that he was so popular in America. This is Lafayette right here in the background, and he was always seen as kind of Lafayette's partner. I mean, Washington's partner or his mm -hmm. adopted son, almost because of course Lafayette had no father at this point and Washington had no sons. But I wanna mention three main things, I think, 
First of all, his lifelong commitment to human rights. And this is an image of Lafayette in the French Revolution with King Louis XVI standing next to the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. And Lafayette introduced the first draft of this declaration in July of 1789. It was later revised and it changed in various ways, but he was a great advocate of basic rights, right, of freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, those kinds of human rights. Was he involved in that great, uh, just a few weeks later, the great repudiation of all noble titles? Uh, he was, he was, and he, of course, he had been known as the Marquis de Lafayette, and never again did he use the term Marquis. He always just wanted to be known as Lafayette. And, and if, any, uh, if he had any title, it would be General Lafayette, but never Marquis. That went into the dustbin of history. Great. Yes. So uh, he's, uh, he's on the right, am I, well, on the right side of history, certainly absolutely committed to uh, this notion of the rights of man and citizen. Unfortunately, in the revolution, he gets caught up in a very polarized situation in which people are interpreting this idea of rights very differently. You know, it's one thing to establish that there are rights of man and citizen, and then it's a matter of well, what are the limits there of state intervention? How, how uh, hard are we going to push this liberation? How many social structures are we going to tear down? How many individuals are we going to tear down in order to guarantee rights for the greater good? How does he negotiate this during the French Revolution in those first years when he's active? And you see, here he is with Louis the Sixteenth, and he envisioned a constitutional monarchy, and he never really moved away from that position. The problem he had was that the king himself was not a cooperative constitutional monarch. He tried to flee the country, the king did, in 1791. Lafayette was profoundly discredited by this event. He never really recovered. So he was trying to promote a system that the monarchists themselves did not like. He was also trying to promote a system that the Republicans, that is the anti-monarchists, could not support. They turned against Lafayette, as did the monarchists. When the Jacobins seized power in August of 1792, his position became untenable. He knew he was going to be arrested and probably killed, so he fled. And this was the great failure of his life. He never could manage that kind of intense conflict. But I think that that story of polarization tells us a lot about the intensity of the French Revolution. Do, do you have a sense, you know, um, his sense of patriotism? Of course, he goes over to the United States and helps America achieve its independence. Uh, but he was a Frenchman, first and foremost. So this must have been a great disappointment for him uh, oh. in, in that he really uh, believed that the, the way forward that he understood how France could sort of square the circle, if you will, and find a way to get that liberty through the constitutional monarchical system, that it would in fact be a revolution for France, um, and yet it went off the rails. It must have been profoundly disappointing for him. Oh, he, he deeply lamented that, and even after, of course, he also opposed Napoleon, because he thought Napoleon did not appreciate human rights, did not understand the importance of constitutional procedures, and then after Napoleon, during the Restoration, a period you know well, I know Max has worked on this period. Too well. Uh, he, he tried to steer a liberal course in which he wanted to participate in the Chamber of Deputies and in the assemblies, but he also was always pushing the government to become more liberal, more open to freedom of religion, more open to diverse points of view. And he finally fell out of favor again, so that in... Um, so that in 1823, 24, he was completely out of the Chamber of Deputies. He, he had lost his base of power. Yep, indeed. Well, you know, one of the things we talk about when we think about rights, um, we tend to cut a little slack for people from earlier eras on issues of race and gender and whatnot. And what I think is remarkable um, is a very modern perspective and a very egalitarian perspective on rights. Um, can we talk a little bit about Lafayette and his position on uh, on slavery? Okay, let me let me call up again this image because I want to I want to share another image here. Um, see, this person on the right is James Armistead, who was an enslaved man in Virginia, 
And one of Lafayette's great achievements was the Virginia Campaign of 1781, in which he was pushing Cornwallis over toward this coast, ended up in Yorktown. And this man, James Armistead, was a, an enslaved man who his master, quote unquote, allowed to work with Lafayette, and he served as a spy. After the revolution, Armistead was still enslaved, and Lafayette worked to give him, uh, to support him, as he petitioned for his freedom, which he eventually achieved in the mid-1780s. And I also put up here an image of Fanny Wright, who was an abolitionist from Scotland, who came with Lafayette to America in 1824, and Fanny was a staunch abolitionist. And throughout Lafayette's uh, mature years, he worked with Fanny to promote abolitionist causes. Um, he was therefore a staunch opponent of slavery, and for him this was the great flaw in American society. This is a famous painting of Lafayette, portrayed with a man uh, assumed to be Ar Armistead, by, this is by the French artist Lapointe. Um, you can see it's a, it's a kind of absurd painting in a sense because no enslaved man in the 1780s was dressed mm. like this. Carry a sword. <laughs> and, right? and, uh, this is a controversial painting, but it suggests that Lafayette had a, a relationship with enslaved people and he honored them. And when he came back to America in 1824, 25, he made a point of seeking out enslaved people during his travels in Virginia and Georgia and other parts of the South. I'm sure that did not enamor him with some Americans uh, who were defending the institution of slavery. That was something they felt he didn't understand. Even Jefferson, who was Lafayette's close friend, Jefferson tried to explain to Lafayette, oh, don't worry, uh, even though slavery is spreading into Missouri and other places, it will eventually disappear. And this is the place where Lafayette and, and Jefferson collided. They, they disagreed about this. And Fanny Wright, who accompanied Lafayette on his trip to America in 1824, went to him, with him to Monticello and got into big arguments with Thomas Jefferson about slavery. I and would love he, to have been a fly on the wall for that. She then eventually ended up in Tennessee, where she bought, with the help of Lafayette and others, bought land to create a plan to, to bring enslaved workers to the, this plantation and then gradually help them develop skills and then free them all. And the, the project eventually collapsed, but she was able to escape and carry with her 30 formerly enslaved people to freedom in Haiti. And Lafayette supported all of this. Wow. So this is Lafayette's commitment to human rights. So I'm curious about um, his relationships with women. Um, uh, it, can you speak a little bit about his re, uh, relation? This is a woman obviously who uh, he admires uh, yes. as an equal, I would assume, and that uh, he values her ideas well enough to fund them and be supportive of them the whole time. What were his relations personally and then in general uh, with women, his perspective on women? Well, of course, he was married to a woman named Adrienne de Noailles, who was from a very important French family. They were happily married by the standards of 18th century relationships. It was really a a close relationship. She even came to him when he was in prison and helped him in Olmutz, a place where he was imprisoned. She died, however, in 1807, and he never married again, but he had a series of close relationships. He was very close to Germaine de Stahl. Mm -hmm. He was very close to Fanny Wright, this woman that I'm noting here. He became good friends with a woman named Cristina Belgiojoso, who was an Italian political activist. He was close to an opera singer named Maria Malabran. He, was, he had many relationships with strong, independent-minded women. And this also was one of the ways in which he supported the rights of different people. He never really advocated for women's suffrage, but he vehemently supported the right of women to join the public sector. And I think you ask, you know, how, how did I get interested in Lafayette? Um, it was because of his support for right for women as well as for enslaved people and people of color, as well as Native Americans. It's really, it is quite remarkable because you just don't, uh, these are the topics that people just sort of gloss over when talking about um, some of the great champions of liberal progress, Thomas Jefferson, for example, uh, yeah. or, or even the French Revolution and it's just complete denial of rights to women when it had this great opportunity 
to find these outliers that um, really point to the lie that everybody thought that way back then, right? Yeah, it's, exactly. You know, there, yeah, there, there were people, things. even we say, well, everybody thought that way then. No, some people did not. And Lafayette uh, consistently opposed slavery, although you can't say he was like the most radical abolitionist of the 19th yeah. century, but for his time, he was certainly ahead of Jefferson and Washington and other founding fathers. And, you know, and, and, and uh, some people would say, uh, Lafayette saw a promise in the potential of people, so he didn't cancel people, if you will, That's to right. modern parlance, right? He didn't cancel people uh, for what, for really grievous uh, faults. And I think that's a, you know, some people could say it's a sign of weakness. You shouldn't be going and hanging out with Jefferson if you disagree with him so completely. But he was able to find that road between polarization. Again, back to that sort of central. I think that's right. Lafayette respected people, people of all social classes. He was not arrogant or pretentious like uh, many French noblemen of his generation and maybe later or earlier. Um, so he wanted to engage with people. And of course, his critics always thought this was a mistake. You can't deal with these people. They're, they're, you know, they're too dangerous. Don't deal with the monarchists. But Lafayette never viewed it that way. Um, um, so we want to uh, go to maybe another episode in which uh, Lafayette was facing a polarized situation. Uh, well, here we have him, of course, and let's go uh, talk a little bit about him in France. Uh, he has, he's on the outs during the age of Napoleon, basically, um, an age of sort of public retreat from public life. Uh, right. You made reference to, uh, I wrote my dissertation on the liberals of the restoration period of, of, uh, of course, Lafayette features heavily in them coming back uh, into public life. This is, uh, tell us where this place is. This is LaGrange. This is LaGrange. Uh, LaGrange, it's, excuse it me, I'm saying it like the ZZ Top. Uh, well, LaGrange, that's how it's pronounced <laughs> in Georgia. There's a wonderful town in Georgia called LaGrange. But LaGrange was a, a, a chateau and lands owned by his wife's family, the Noai family, and she was able to get this property at the end of the revolution, hang on to it, and it was the only place Lafayette could go. This is a 19th century image of LaGrange. This is a modern image. I, I had the great opportunity to go there with a group, a wonderful group called the American Friends of Lafayette about five years ago, and I took this picture myself. I love it because I had all my life as a scholar read about LaGrange and I had never gone there. Yeah. But he was from there, a leader of the international liberal movement. But then he came back to America in 1824, and this is another aspect of Lafayette's life, a second key aspect, I think, his relationship to, an, to nationalism. He made this tour and wherever he went, they put up arches. This is one in Philadelphia. He attracted huge crowds. Mm -hmm. I often compare him to a rock star because they had souvenir shirts, hats, gloves. This is, you could get a pair of gloves with Lafayette's picture on it. So Lloyd, was this, uh, was the mania for naming places after Lafayette after this visit more than it was after the revolution itself? Yes, there had been one town, the city of Fayetteville in North Carolina. I've heard of it. Fayetteville, <laughs> it's a great Fayetteville, North Carolina. Uh, but the great uh, expansion of naming for Lafayette came at this time. Lafayette Square in Washington, D.C., which we hear a lot about these days, was named in this period. Lafayette College was founded in this period, named for Lafayette mm -hmm. after his visit. And I know as a, as a uh, alum of the University of Vermont, I know as a, uh, the, one of the main buildings at the University of Vermont has a cornerstone that was laid by the Marquis de Lafayette during oh, really? this visit. Yeah, so. So there's something like 60 towns, counties, um, you know, townships named for Lafayette or Lagrange. And these are scattered all over America, all the way to California and Colorado, other places. Could you give us a sense of the duration and the geographical, ex geographical extent of his visit? Um, he, uh, whoops, I went ahead before I wanted to. He traveled through all of the 24 then existing American states, U.S. states. He arrived in New York City in uh, August of 1824. He went north to New England. He eventually went down to uh, Philadelphia, Washington, uh, was greeted in Congress. He, he went to Yorktown for the anniversary of the Battle of Yorktown. Um, he then traveled through North Carolina. He traveled all the way through every Southern state, all the way to New Orleans. It was a, a, an unbelievable tour. And there were, there were literally hundreds of thousands, probably millions of people who saw Lafayette. And everywhere he went, he gave a speech, he was celebrated, there were dances, there were balls. It was one of the great events in early American history. 
And everywhere he went, he contributed to American national identity by saying, America, you have achieved what George Washington and his colleagues envisioned. You have done well. You are the exceptional nation. And he appealed to the ideology of American exceptional. And, and that was a, a, an important message, but also a difficult message to deliver because going back to this theme of polarization, he was not entering a United States that was feeling very triumphant about a unified vision. Can well, you it was, it was a terribly that? divisive moment, 1824, the election of 1824. Uh, it may not be the most divisive we've ever had. We're moving into that territory ourselves right now, but it wasn't exactly like 1800. But the competition between John Quincy Adams and a Andrew Jackson was very regional. It was bitter. It ended up in the House of Representatives where John Quincy Adams narrowly prevailed. And Lafayette somehow managed to maintain friendships with everybody because the one thing everybody could agree on, Jacksonians and, and Quincy Adams followers, everything they could agree on was America is different from Europe and superior to Europe. That they agreed on. And it's interesting, I, I, not knowing the era too well, but certainly knowing the geographical areas that Quincy Adams and Jackson represented in their stance on things like human rights. Um, John Quincy Adams at this point is already uh, questioning slavery, certainly. And That's Jackson, right. of course, That's is- right. uh, so Lafayette had actually known John Quincy Adams when he was a boy and come to Paris with his father, John Adams, back in the right. 1780s. <laughs> Uh, so it's you know it's a tough thing to wait in knowing some. Uh, my point being, someone who has such strong convictions about these things, at the same time trying to uh, give a, a message of championing American exceptionalism and entering into this polarized situation in which he cares a lot about this stuff as well, but uh, is not uh, uh, taking a, a stance too strongly. To uh, that's right, he's anyone. trying not to alienate people, but he has strong opinions. Well, let's get, we want to uh, be, make sure we can get to people's questions. So let's talk a little bit about his legacy. And of course, what are we looking at here? Well, I do want to get to questions. I just want to mention that after Lafayette's death in 1834, he remained an important figure in French-American relations. This is Lafayette's grave in uh, Picpou Cemetery in Paris. And in 1917, there was a very famous visit by General John Pershing, who with his uh, aide-de-camp, uh, Colonel Stanton, they arrived and he, they said, Lafayette, we are here. So Lafayette remained for over a hundred years the symbol of relations between France and America. By the way, this flag flies over Lafayette's grave and during the period of the Nazi occupation, it was the only place in France where the American flag continued to fly. And then I just want to mention, if we talk about his legacy, there's a great statue of Lafayette in Lafayette Square and we know that even in 2020, Lafayette is at the center of a very polarized conflict. Here's uh, the famous walk by Donald Trump from Lafayette Square, and over on the other image, protesters in the Black Lives Matter movement. I mention this because Lafayette is still part of our political culture in 2020, mm -hmm. and his legacy of human rights is still part of our debate today. So I just wanted to mention that. Well, but I know, it, let's go. You're right. Let's go to the question. Absolutely fascinating. And, you know, and I love the way we can see that, you know, I, I would like to, of course, we can't do this because Lafayette has long since passed on. But how would Lafayette into, enter into our polarized uh, political climate, affirm American exceptionalism and weave his way through these very difficult issues without alienating anyone? That seems a very difficult task. Maybe. Uh, Lafayette is glad he doesn't yeah, have and, to And when I say today. he wove his way through the middle, it's not that he didn't alienate people. In fact, he <laughs> tended to alienate people on all sides. <laughs> yeah, that's what <laughs> happens. Right? So it is not an easy place to be, but he also tried to engage with people on all sides. And I think that's what he would say. Um, he wouldn't give up on his principles. Well, but I want to... I want to thank you for that. And as you know, I, I uh, personally know Lafayette from a period of time that not many people study, 1819 to 1823. And I know how absolutely frustrated he was by the polarization in France at that time. And I also know how many people did not like him. That's right. <laughs> so, so I'm not saying he was popular all the time, but in America, he was loved by both sides of the political spectrum.
Great. Well, thank you for that, uh, Lloyd. It's a, I, I can't believe that we've been able to do uh, a talk between the two of us on Lafayette and go for only 36 minutes, but we do want to make sure we have time for questions for all of our uh, people. I'm so I want to get right to them. Um, and I also remind folks, there's a question and answer peg at the bottom. We'll get to them as many as we can. If you put your question in chat, I will try to see it, but it's much better if you can get it down in the question and answer. So let's go first with Josh. I hope I pronounced it like a neater Heiser who asked, do you think Lafayette's middle of the road stance during the French Revolution was a matter of wishful thinking, the best solution he could see to avoid a revolution, or his true thoughts and feelings on the subject? I, I actually think Lafayette represented his true, his true feelings. I think he felt that for France, the monarch represented a tradition of French national identity, but that the monarchy had to be drastically changed and made more representative and democratic and he tried to stake out that middle position. So I, I have no doubt that it was his genuinely felt position. You know, in a way uh, that the episode at 1830, when he's, you know, 73 years old, to come back into the public stage and say, this is in fact the constitutional monarchy that I tried to envision in 1790, uh, okay. it kind of that gives you a sense of his consistency. I, I think that he, he very much supported major reforms in the old regime, though including more human rights and political participation. Great, thank you for that. And uh, Mark Yarborough asks, uh, he was a man, both a man of action and an idealist. How many battles in the revolution did he actually participate in? Actual, i.e. actual battlefield participation. Well, there are others who could give the exact number better than I. His first important battle was at Brandywine where he was wounded in September of 1777. He was involved in other battles um, in the Philadelphia area, Barren Hill, for example. He was almost captured during the time, this was in a year or so later. He went back to France for about a year to work on the task of bringing the French army into the war. So he was not involved in anything in 1779. He was involved, um, also I should say he, he was advocating for a, an attack on New York in 1780, it never happened. But his most important military action was definitely when Washington sent him to Virginia to command a battalion of a, an outpost of the Continental Army with only 12 or 1500 troops, but to harass, first to capture Benedict Arnold, then to harass Cornwallis. So that was his key military contribution. Yeah, that campaign, Cornwallis. that campaign in Virginia is really fascinating uh, uh, subject there for such a young man to be in charge of foreign troops in essentially rural territory in the middle of, a, you know, the wilds of Virginia at this point. Uh, truly it, it shows how much Washington trusted him because mm -hmm. this was a very important um, action and to send this 24 year old man down there to command the troops was a vote of great confidence in Lafayette's skills. Great, we have a question here from Mackenzie Fowler. Lafayette, as was mentioned, was able to move within many different people and groups despite differences of opinion. Who are some notable British citizens that Lafayette managed to befriend? Well, his, his best friends tended to be abolitionists. For example, a man named Thomas Clarkson, who was a very important leader of the abolitionist movement. He also knew Jeremy Bentham. He had a lot of communications with the utilitarian leader, Bentham. Um, I, I want to stress also, he had a relationship with Mary Shelley. He didn't really know her well, but in 1830, she wrote um, Lafayette. This was, you know, the author of Frankenstein, the, mayor, the husband, the, I shouldn't, sorry, the wife of Percy Shelley, the great poet. She wrote him and said, you represent everything my late husband supported. And of course, his friendship with Fanny Wright, who was Scottish, we can't call her English, but uh, he, he had many connections with people in the abolitionist movement and in the international liberal movement. And of, and of course, uh, uh, Mary Shelley's own family uh, was uh, known for their stance on civil rights, right? Uh, her parents. That's so. right. Yeah, I think that's right. So uh, Carol Ann Dobson's asked, when, and I'm going to combine these questions. So I have a question from Carol Ann Dobson and one from uh, M.L. Thern. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And I'm combining them here. When do you think uh, Lafayette began to think that slavery was wrong. I gather that he bought a slave when he first went to the U.S. And the second was, wasn't there slavery in the French colonies at the time? Was he opposed to that? So sort of a broader look on slavery. 
So he did not bring any, he did not have a, a, an enslaved servant during the revolution. He did work with James Armistead, who was enslaved. Um, he became a staunch opponent of slavery really during the 1780s. And he wrote to Washington around the time he came back. Lafayette made a visit to the United States in 1784. And he proposed to Washington that they should both uh, buy plant, or they should free enslaved people. He wanted Washington to free his slaves at Mount Vernon, and he was going to support this as a campaign. And Lafayette then decided to buy his own plantation in Cayenne in South America and have enslaved workers who would be trained as carpenters and, and stone workers and so forth, and then they would be freed, just like Fanny Wright did. This was when he became a, a leader in the uh, Society for the Friends of Blacks in France, which was an abolitionist organization. So it was really in the 1780s that he became an abolitionist. He also uh, remained supportive of abolition even more after the Napoleonic period. And, and as far as the French colonies, yes, there was slavery in all of the French colonies uh, until 1794 when the Jacobins abolished slavery. And then when one of the worst things Napoleon ever did, he reestablished slavery in the Caribbean islands in Guadeloupe and Martinique and Saint-Domingue. Yeah, thanks to Josephine. Thank you for that little influence on Napoleon uh, being from Saint-Domingue herself. Uh, that we know that she was very, very adamant about that. If there was one political thing, it was uh, slavery. Um, just out of curiosity, was he, did he ever have correspondence with Abbe Gregoire about, uh, about slavery? I think he did. I just don't know the details of that, but I know, um, yes. I, I think enough, enough of my questions, more for our... That's a good question. I, <laughs> hey, I'm not the expert. I should be. I've, I've still got a lot of reading to do. So another group uh, that Lafayette might have come into contact with, Ingrid Wood asks, can you please speak to Lafayette's involvement with Native Americans? So Lafayette came to know people in the Oneida um, nation. First, uh, during the revolution, when he had some contacts and negotiations with them. And then when he came back in the 1780s on a trip, there were some conflicts going on with the, the people, the European settlers in New York and with the Oneida. He went and met with them there. He tried to negotiate. He was much respected by people in the Oneida nation. He even took with him a young man from the Oneida community back to France for education and opportunities. And this young man was sent back to America somewhat later. Um, during his tour in 1824-25, he again met with Native American communities. Um, I think he met with members of the Oneida community. He met with people in the uh, uh, Creek, um, in, in the Southeast. He, he met various um, Native Americans. He kept urging better relations between European Americans and Native Americans. I think he was naive probably about this, but he believed that these people should be respected and have rights just like other people on the American continent. I'd be curious. I know he uh, didn't get to experience France's great colonial expansion, but he was alive when France went into Algeria. And I'd just be curious if there was a crossover between his uh, way that uh, Western states deal with native peoples. Um, if that you know, might this is, I, I want to say I have looked for more information on his view of the Algerian campaign after 1830. And I have not, that is a future research project. Well, because his main involvement in 1831, 32 was with the Polish revolution. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I clearly see the Algerian occupation as a violation of his support for national and local rights. Well, as an, as an aside, if anyone is interested in, in having one of your liberal champions, uh, maybe be diminished if uh, someone read Tocqueville on uh, on uh, Algeria. It's quite eye opening. Let's get on with some other questions. Now, listen, we tried to do this quickly, but we predicted that Lloyd would, and I would have a lot to say about Lafayette. So, if it's okay with you folks, we're going to stay on. If it's okay with you, Dr. Kramer, to take a few more questions, um, and we'll try to answer them as quickly as we can. And I'll try not to interject. Got to watch my own demons. Jules, this is from Caroline Dobson. Jules Cloquet says Lafayette had been hazelized. Thatcher or Thatcher says gray blue. Do you know their color? Hmm. As he had red hair, I suspect they were gray blue. And as Cloutier yeah, knew, I, I think that's color. right. Um, I, I do. 
You know, I, I've probably read about his eyes, but I just can't remember. There's probably somebody in this audience who can send in the, the exact eye color of Lafayette. <laughs> <laughs> his, yeah. When you say, but great, when, when you get into eye colors like gray, blue, and hazel, then it just all becomes a matter of opinion. Yeah, I, I don't think he had uh, deep brown eyes. Let's put it that way. Okay, uh, from Bennett uh, Weather, did Lafayette leave many writings, such as letters from him, essays, memoirs, speeches, and the like? Uh, there are thousands of letters. There are speeches from many, many years in the Chamber of Deputies. After his death, his family published a six-volume collection of letters, speeches, documents from all years of his life. It's an amazing collection. There are also huge collections of his manuscript letters. This is how I actually got involved with Lafayette. When I was a PhD student at Cornell, I worked with a man named Stanley Edzerda, and Stan was the editor-in-chief of the Lafayette papers, and we published, a, I wasn't involved in all the volumes, but Stan published five volumes of Lafayette's letters. So yes, there's a huge number of letters and documents. Great, I'm gonna to try to combine a couple questions here. There are two questions in chat, one from uh, um, Beatrice Parker and one from Jan Robinson. And we also have a question here from Polly Lyman. Um, so I'm gonna kind of combine them if I could. Beatrice sure. is interested in the stance of human rights and how that might affect uh, his uh, appreciation in American history, why he's not elevated in American history as much because of his stance on human rights. And then the question is comparing uh, to France. So. Jan Robertson says, has Lafayette's footprint in France been exaggerated after his death to attract U.S. tourists? And then Polly's question is, Lafayette has always been revered in the U.S. Has the French people's view of Lafayette changed over the years? So I guess wrapping those three up about where does Lafayette fit in American history? Why isn't he maybe as, as strong as, and how do the French really feel about it? And are they playing up the connection because of U.S.? Well, there's no question that he's always been far more popular in the United States than in France because the, the factions that turned against him in the French Revolution, they always remained critical of him. That is, the radicals on the left condemned Lafayette, the radicals on the right condemned Lafayette. He, um, you know, he, he was not that visible in French historical memory. He's been far more important in American historical memory. But I, I think the French have played up some of the Lafayette links for tourists. There is the, the chateau at Chavignac where he grew up down in the south in the, <clears throat> the area of Auvergne. Um, he's never been so popular in France. There is the Gallery Lafayette. There is a Boulevard Lafayette. There are, you know, there are marks of Lafayette's life, but there are not lots of statues of Lafayette in France. There are a few. Um, he's far more important in America. And I think it's because he fit more comfortably into American nationalism than into French nationalism. I think, and you know, and Graham, I'm going to just read Graham's question here, but it kind of already as you've already addressed it. But just to say, Graham is making this point as well. Graham Brent, uh, how is it possible that Lafayette's reputation in America dimmed so much in the hundred years following the famous "We Are Here" Lafayette and remark in 1917, to the extent that the newly opened Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia hardly does him justice? Mm -hmm. No, I... So Lafayette's historical reputation declined quite a bit during the 20th century. I, I think it was because historians, uh, the most famous of whom was Louis Godshock, who wrote a, six volumes on Lafayette, um, they were very skeptical of the kind of mythological figure of Lafayette. They tended to look at his flaws and his mistakes. Um, it was a, a period in which there was a rethinking of historical figures, and obviously every Every historical figure has flaws, including Lafayette, and where he had been celebrated as almost a saint-like figure, there was a kind of backlash and his importance declined. It may also be that Americans did not want to celebrate the importance of France in winning their own revolution. You know, mm -hmm. it's sort of like the narrative was, we defeated the greatest empire of the world, and when there was a lot of emphasis on the French connection, Lafayette was important. If you diminish that theme, Lafayette becomes less important. Um, right. We did it ourselves, you know, that's a, that's a more mm -hmm. uh, energizing nationalist method. And it's certainly as American power becomes stronger in the 20th century and the discourse becomes, we're helping France out, it, it, it only builds to that sort of negating uh, Lafayette's contribution. 
Yeah. I have two. I have two questions that use the word naive. So I'm going to try to. I'm going to try to put them together. From Carol Ann Dobson and from Bennett uh, Weathered, we have. Uh, do you think that perhaps Lafayette was naive and not attempting to move his family out of France shortly before he himself had to flee to avoid being guillotined? And another question about naivete is, is it fair to think of Lafayette as naive? I don't mean this as a slam, but to advocate for a constitutional monarchy when the two sides would not tolerate, tolerate it, that seems obvious in hindsight, seems so. He was very well-meaning and sincere, but naive. Again, I mean no ill. Bennett, where it's a safe space, no one feels uh, no one feels any uh, uh, bad thoughts there. What do you think of Carol's point about his actual behavior in the revolution with his family, and then the broader idea about you know a naive political stance on constitutional monarchy? So, so first on the question of why didn't he get his family out, um, you know I don't think he had any idea how rapidly the situation was going to evolve. Nobody could imagine that it was going to become so radical so quickly. And we can see in hindsight how that was happening. But even in 1791, he thought maybe this system would work. Um, I, I do think, he, you know, they tried to get their son out. In fact, Adrienne did get George Washington Lafayette, the son of Lafayette, got out and came to America, actually spent time at Mount Vernon. But um, he simply, he was naive. He was naive in that he could not imagine what was coming. You know, it's like, what's going to happen in the United States over the next six months? We, we can't predict this. We, we don't know. We know we're in the midst of, a, of turmoil. And I, I think this is where our situation now kind of reminds me of people who live through revolutionary upheavals. You can't see what's coming. And so, yes, we are naive right now. Someone's going to look at us and say we're naive. Lafayette was naive. Also, was he naive in thinking that he could work out a system that would bring the two sides together. Yes, I think that was probably naive. Um, but he was an idealist and he thought he could make it work. But uh, Napoleon thought he was, he called him a simpleton, you know, simple-minded. Nier, I think was the term. Mm -hmm. And for Napoleon, the problem with Lafayette was he didn't know how to just slam people down. You gotta mm -hmm. just slam them down. And Lafayette never would be a dictator because he could not do that to his opponents. Yeah. Is so maybe he was naive. Maybe um, if you're really going to seize power in a revolutionary situation, you've got to be the one to kill people. And Lafayette really didn't want to do that. Well, I appreciate that. And it's a, it's a stance that we find decent people taking because you know unfortunately sometimes people that act too hard on their principles as you know in the french revolution uh go to extremes of violence and and you know this is uh doesn't help build anything you know uh, that's the irony lafayette was a true believer i think that's a fair statement he had deep beliefs but he was not a true believer who believed that therefore people who don't agree with me should be shot well he was a true believer in the principles but he also was a true believer in rights that's right you know, so um, I'm going to get a couple of very uh, quick answers because uh, Julie has two questions. Julie uh, Diddle was Lafayette's relationship with the other French generals. What was Lafayette's relationship with other French generals after the French Revolution? And can you talk briefly about the S.B. Morse portrait of him in 1824? Um, yeah, briefly on both of those. Um, he never was in the army again after 1792. He didn't have a lot of relationships with military people, except uh, those that became liberals themselves. Uh, he did remain in contact with some of the American generals he had known well and who were in the Society of the Cincinnati, as he was after the uh, American Revolution. I, I do not think he had particularly good or close relations with leaders of the French military after the French Revolution. Great. Um, so that wasn't an important part of his later life. Uh, the portrait by Samuel Morris, the inventor of the telegraph, by the way, as a young man, Morris uh, met Lafayette he came, when he was in New York. He painted his portrait. He later went to Paris to try to be an artist. And along with James Fenimore Cooper, who was his good friend, uh, Morris saw Lafayette in Paris. He was a great admirer. And that portrait is also important. Um, I have an image of it, but I can't pull it up immediately. Um, but it wasn't nearly as influential as Ari Sheffer's portrait. Right. But it is an important and famous portrait. 
Well, I predicted that we would go pretty long on this one because Lloyd and I just love this topic so much and we can't resist yourself. And it sounds like all of you are very interested in it with all of your questions. I'm going to leave with Robert Kraut's question. When you wrote the book on Lafayette about 19, around 1994, your conclusion seemed to, to celebrate the triumph of liberal democracy around the world. It seems that developments in China and Russia have led you to reconsider that triumph. Nowadays, it seems that America as a model is challenged in many places. Is it time for your new conclusion? Are you giving us that today? Ah, thank you, Robert. That's an excellent question. You know, the conclusion of that book argues that Lafayette is important. I, I wrote that book in the late 90s. And I said, in a time when political culture is now about celebrities and gossip and big money, Lafayette and his generation have something to say to us about the importance of public values and commitment to the public good and to the values of democracy. I think when I wrote that, it seemed that we were facing a challenge in, in Europe and in Asia. I think now Lafayette's even more important in 2020 because I think in the United States, we need to be reminded of what he stood for and what he meant and therefore, I'm not giving a new conclusion. In fact, I would reiterate the points of the conclusion in that book, that if we lose the vision that Lafayette and his friends had in the 1780s, we lose the core of what we can stand for in the 21st century. And this is why I'm still interested in Lafayette, even after all these years and many other projects. I think he still speaks to our time and still has a message that resonates in the crisis and in the polarization we face in 2020. So thank you, Robert, but I won't rewrite that conclusion. I wanna reaffirm that conclusion. Well, thank you for that, and thank you for all your questions. I'm sorry that we don't have time for any more questions. I see one popping up, but I would please take that question and feel free to contact us at Carolina Public Humanities, and we'll get it in front of Dr. Kramer. We've gone a little bit over than what we're supposed to at this point. I wanna remind everyone that uh, friend, Lunch with Friends and Strangers continues throughout the semester. Our next one is coming up on October 9th. Ninth. We'll be talking about Ida B. Wells uh, with Kathy Williams, a really great perspective on that. We're looking at, we're going to have Leonard Brezhnev, Billie Jean King, uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, um, and uh, Joseph Lady, a, 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 a paleontologist from the 19th century, a wide range of people. Uh, so please come and join us for that. We want to thank the GAA and Catherine Nichols in particular for helping put this whole thing together. It's just a great project. Share it with your friends. Uh, we like to talk about people that are interesting with interesting people. I briefly want to mention that uh, humanities.unc.edu has a calendar of our other events, including Humanities in Action next Wednesday with historian Dirk Moses talking about uh, genocide as a concept and how we need to approach it, um, as well as we have a couple events with Lloyd. We, we like to work Lloyd. Uh, Lloyd will be next Thursday running a conversation, uh, a salon conversation. This is a limited uh, group uh, for an in-depth conversation on uh, an article by a colleague of ours, Molly Worthen. Can you give us a little sense of the topic, Lloyd? Um, the, the topic is, is the trouble with empathy. She wrote an article for the New York Times about whether empathy is an appropriate emotion in the current world. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about that article and I would love to have a group of friends join me for the conversation. I understand how you feel about that topic. Um, <laughs> Thank you. You feel uh, my pain. Yeah, feel your pain. And uh, finally, we have, of course, Adventures and Ideas coming up. Our next Adventures and Ideas. We're wrapping up our Dictators one that we did this week. We hope some of you were able to join us for that. Our next Adventures and Ideas is in the week following, not next week, but the week following. We'll be doing elections. Uh, Lloyd Kramer will be coming back and doing the American election of 1800. We have a uh, dear friend, Freddie Kiger, wonderful speaker. We'll be doing the election of 1860. And Suzanne Globetti will be looking at the election of 1868. I could tell you all of our programs. We don't have time for that. We'd steer you to our website, humanities.unc.edu. We steer you to our, uh, our Facebook uh, pages and Instagram for more information. One more time, Lloyd, always a pleasure talking to you. Uh, Max, it is a great pleasure, and this is a great series, and it was such an honor to be able to talk about Lafayette in the current context. And, and I want to thank all the people who joined us who have an interest in Lafayette. I wish I could show one more slide. Yeah, go know, ahead. You're, you're, I, know, I know people have probably left the room, but I want to show this one just to show the idea of how important Lafayette is. This is a wonderful statue of Lafayette in Fayetteville, North Carolina, the first city in America named for Lafayette. 
This was erected by the Lafayette Society in Fayetteville. And there is a wonderful group of people who are trying to understand Lafayette's legacy and continue the conversation. So we're just part of a wider community. Each life leads us into a network of discussions and ideas. Thanks, well, Matt. I know, thank you. And I know uh, this is, uh, before we get going on, we could just keep going. Uh, it is interesting that I saw a list of potential names for replacements of Confederate generals. And one of the top names for Fort Bragg is Fort Lafayette, which would be interesting. <laughs> which would be interesting. All right, well, Thanks, let's everybody. Have a wonderful uh, evening, weekend.